chapter 4. I'm sorry, I said Acts chapter 5. I want to go to Acts chapter 4. I want to preach tonight on something that, uh, uh, you know, the Bible says to preach the whole counsel of God and, and preach the Word of God and um, feed the flock of God. And uh, there's a lot of issues and so forth. And I'm a strong believer that preaching and, and, and our worship, and that, that song was so good because it lifts us in the presence of Christ and it brings Christ into the service. And I like that kind of, I like it kind of thing. But nonetheless, we are in the world and, and uh, a lot of issues are dealing with. And there is a reason I'm preaching on what I'm preaching tonight. And preaching on the subject is socialism <clears throat> as a philosophy of government biblical. Biblical. Is socialism as a philosophy of government biblical? And, uh, and, and, uh, why Christians should not embrace socialism. And it's a very serious, serious thing, and that's the reason I'm preaching it. I'm not just preaching it to address a cultural issue or a political issue. Socialism has tremendous ramifications against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be preaching on that tonight. And in Acts chapter 4, I'm, I want to read this passage of Scripture. And the Bible said in verse 32, if you want to kick over to verse 32... Now, in the background of this, the disciples had been preaching, praying, getting the gospel out. Uh, They had been beaten. They had been commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's a time of severe persecution of the church. And uh, they have come back in uh, there, and they were praying, and they were in one accord, and and, uh, they prayed that God would give them great boldness to preach the gospel. And uh, let me just tell you this, that at a time... When there's persecution of this type going on, it is not unusual for people to bind together and, and come in a unity together in a way that they may not normally do it in order to survive and in order to have encouragement, strength one for another. But socialists in America right now use this text that I'm getting ready to read as a basis that Christians should practice socialism and that they are, quote, on scriptural grounds in promoting uh, socialism. I hate to tell you this, but in Bible colleges and Christian colleges across America, surveys are showing that not just a slight majority, but a large majority of Christian Bible college students believe that socialism should be the future of this country. That's a problem. That's a serious, serious problem. And socialists have learned how to manipulate Christian people into their philosophy. And as I said, it's very, very dangerous for the propagation of the Christian faith. And we'll get into that just a little bit later. Verse number 32 says, And the multitude of them, that's the disciples, the Christians there, that believed were of one heart and one soul. Boy, that's, uh, that'd be a good place to get, wouldn't it? Neither said any of them, now watch this, neither said any of them, that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace is upon them all. Verse 32 is their great, they use that verse as a socialistic verse, that they had all things in common, that they did not own anything personally themselves. Verse 34, they pick it up again, they say, Neither was there any among them that lacked, For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now you, if you've ever read Marx's declaration on socialism and communism, you will not believe how close that verse is to Marx's uh, description of it. I'll probably read that a little bit later. This is pretty, pretty powerful stuff right here. And that they, they laid it down, he said, that they distributed every man his head according to his need. And, and Joseph, by, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which was being interpreted the son of consolation, Levite, into the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So what you have here is an account of commonality or communalism and where people literally sold their possessions and their lands and possessions, brought it to the apostles' feet, and allowed them then to distribute it among the saints as, the, as they saw need there. And so they'll use that passage of Scripture as a basis to convince Christian young people especially that socialism is scriptural and biblical. 
The question tonight, is that a true analysis, a true summary, a true conclusion to this passage of Scripture? Well, it's interesting that when you get into chapter 5, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price of it, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and uh, to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, verse 4 is the counter to verses 33 and verses 35 in the previous chapter. I want you to notice what Peter recognizes that God says about ownership. He said in verse 4, whilst it remained, in other words, before you gave it to the church, was it not, and underline this in your Bible, thine own. This was not communal property. And Peter recognized that, that he had a right to have that personal property. And then he said this, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? That's very critical to bring that into context with when somebody throws Acts 4 to you about socialism. Now let me just uh, give you a key thought about socialism versus biblical giving. Socialism is forced redistribution of wealth. Biblical giving is voluntary, spirit-motivated, without coercion, manipulation, taxation forced. Someone told me about a church. I just absolutely could not believe it that uh, they're, they're you know, within some miles of here, that they're checking, they're telling people we need to look at your tax returns to see if you're tithing. I don't want to see your tax returns. I'm not interested in it. And I don't want you to look at mine either. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. And the Bible teaches voluntarily giving. And it teaches that we ought to do that. And that is part of our Christian faith. But the Bible never teaches forced redistribution and forced confiscation of other people's property. It literally is totally antithetic to socialism in chapter 4 because they brought it voluntarily, willingly to the apostles and said, you know something, we're giving up our life for the life of Christ and the cause of Christ. And we're going to sell our possessions. And they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God to do this. There's not anything wrong. If you want to do that, do that. But no one should be able to force you to sell your home or sell your land and give it to a church. Much less the government. So, uh, now, I want to give you something else about this. You never, ever see this done again in the Bible. In fact, it didn't work. And it didn't work by evidence of chapter 5 because people began to be crooked and lie and deceive. And it's never practiced again in the church and the rest of the Bible. Okay? So you cannot use Acts chapter 4 as a basis for socialism. Number one, it was voluntary, cheerful giving and sharing of other people's, uh, your property. It was not forced upon people and confiscated and taken away by the government. Okay, so that's very, very important. Historically, America has experimented with socialism. One of the, er- the earliest, uh, one of the earliest uh, settlements was Jamestown. I don't know if you know much about Jamestown. There are, by the way, if you look this up now on the Internet, you will find out that they're rewriting history about Jamestown. They literally are rewriting it and making it out to me that it wasn't like we, it used to be in the histor- history books. And, but let me tell you, the true history of Jamestown is that it was, they were sent over here on three ships, 100, maybe 140, 150 men, whatever it was, 100 and some people, men, men and boys, came over here, established for some people in, in uh, uh, England for the sole purpose of getting riches, searching for gold and silver and, and wealth, fast wealth. And that's what and they were going to be given a percentage of it and so forth. And by, by that reason that they were supposed to find gold and silver and precious metals and so forth in this new land, they did not plant crops. Because they were out looking for the fast money. And by not planting crops, they became, uh, they had what they called starvation. And whenever Mr. Smith came in there finally, and, you know, he set up a deal that if you will not work, you will not eat. And what happened was the people that wouldn't work who were out digging for gold would come back to the settlement, would eat the, eat the food of those people who did work. And it got into a big mess. It was a socialistic experiment, and they, they, they thought they liked that. 
But Smith come in and he said, listen, this, the, and by the way, they, they had a, it's, it's a long story, several year story. But he set it up and he finally said, listen, we're going to all starve to death like this because they said the non-workers are stealing the food of the workers. The people who want to hit it rich and head back to England. And he said, we're going to make it so that if you don't work, you do not eat at, in this settlement. And so they blew, they, they got rid of socialism right off the bat. It's just like the story of the little hen. She found the grain, and she said to some other uh, uh, chickens, well, do you want to help me plant this grain? No, not interested. So she planted it, and she nurtured it, and she plant, pulled the weeds, and she nurtured the growth of it. And she asked him, would you help uh, till the ground, and would you help pull the weeds? No, we're not interested. And then she harvested it. Would somebody help me harvest it? No, we're not interested. She harvested it, and then she made bread out of it. She said, would anybody help me cook the bread and knead the dough? No, we're not interested. And after she made the bread, she said, well, I think I'll just eat my loaf of bread. No, you can't. It belongs to us. That's socialism. It is theft. Anyway, we're going to get into some things here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19 says that we're to work, we're to live in the sweat of, of our face. God said you need to work. And part of the curse is that you're going to sweat, you're going to labor, you're going to work uh, to, to survive. I want to read you a definition of socialism. A previously, as previously stated, socialism is an economic system in which the government, rather than individuals, controls a nation's businesses and interests. Socialists believe that the individual is unimportant. I want you to listen to this, because you're, you're, you're facing history right now. You're going to face the next election. You're going to either vote for a capitalist or a socialist. Every, every Democrat candidate right now that has announced is a socialist. Every one of them. Every one of them believes in confiscating your homes, your property, your businesses, and believes in somewhere between 70 and 90% taxes on you. And they've gotten their mind to do it now. They're not joking. And they're hoping we just sit here and play church and don't educate ourselves and don't prepare ourselves and don't fight. But socialists believe that individually is unimportant when compared to the welfare of the group at large. They insist that the government must strictly regulate and control a nation's resources in order to ensure that everyone receives an equal share of the nation's wealth. Communism is a form of socialism. Now, this is critical to understand this. Communism is not what they're proposing right now. But socialism is a for communism is a form of socialism which communism requires a violent, bloody revolution in order to set up a totalitarian dictatorship that controls every aspect of people's lives through force and terror. The main difference, and listen to this tonight, the main difference between uh, socialism and communism lies in their methods. Socialist, democratic, and by the way, this is a catchword now. The catchword among all these candidates is we want to impose or bring into this country what they call democratic socialism. Well, first of all, we're not a democracy, and I don't care what anybody tells you. We're a constitutional republic. And, but they're adding the word democracy because democracy from the time of John F. Kennedy has become a, a, I mean, people start, they use it as a way of our government, but it's not. It's a lie that's been already embraced and received into the minds of American people. But they know if they attach the word democracy to socialism, that makes it more palatable. That makes it more receiving for people to say, well, it must not be so bad. But here's the difference between it. Socialists seek through legislation, regulation, taxation, and overthrow of the existing government. Whereas communism says we will violently overthrow it. Now, that's, that's where we're at in history right now. As we are in this socialist movement, they are trying by... Courts, legislative action, taxation, regulation to impose socialism on this country. Now, let me tell you why you're seeing these, these sparks of violence out here among these socialist groups. is because all the, every socialist college kid who's set under this stuff knows that in the end, all, their goal is communism. And they know that Every communist regime and every socialist regime usually winds up having to be done through violence. And so that's why you have Antifa, Black Lives Matter, SDS, and so forth, 
all preparing themselves for military training because they're what they're saying is, if Trump gets elected again, we have no choice but to violently overthrow this nation. Now, we'll get some of that a little bit later. In the Old Testament, God taught that the children of Israel had the right to sit under their own vine and their own fig tree. He taught personal land ownership and personal property ownership. The very uh, existence of the Ten Commandments teaches personal ownership and property. Thou shall not steal. If you, uh, it, the fact that a person, God said, the fact that a person, God says you can be stolen from, says you have personal property. If it doesn't belong to you, if I take it from you, it didn't belong to you. If I steal Matt's coat tonight and we're socialist, his coat can belong to me. And if I take it, I'm not stealing. But God says, thou shalt not steal. And he is inferring that he has, God has inculcated into human, human government the private personal ownership of property and that, that can, and that can be taken. And when it's taken, it's a violation of law. God's law. And so the fact that you can steal means that God has ordained personal ownership and personal property. Because if, if, if we don't have personal property, nobody can steal off anybody. No socialist government or promoters of socialist government ever really loved Scripture or embraced Scripture ideology. They can't. They're diametrically opposed, and I'll show you tonight. Every socialist I have ever known or heard of is a royal super hypocrite of the first order. Hitler was a socialist, and he stole. He had a complete system of thievery, and they stole Jewish property. The reason they had Christianite and wanted to kill all the Jews because the Jews did have a lot of wealth, and they did own a lot of stores, and they did own a lot of banks, and they controlled a lot of wealth. And he wanted it. By the way, our soldiers, in, when they took over, uh, uh, the, uh, got into Austria and took over a lot of Hitler stuff, they, they, they've discovered total caves with the wealth and the art of Jewish people that they had stolen. Un, unbelievable wealth that they stole. Socialists always steal. And they drove the Jews out and they stole their property. They, they stole their store goods. And they, they made them pay everything they owned just to get out of the country, those that could. Socialists are thieves. They've always been thieves. Somebody says, well, now, see, the, the, the liberals right now are trying to tag conservatives as Nazis. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. And they'll, they'll, they try to use the argument that Hitler and Stalin fought each other. But what, they'll don't, what they do not tell you in history is that Hitler and St Stalin had a non-aggression pact long before Hitler ever attacked Stalin. They were both socialists. They both did what socialists do, and that's steal the property and, and, and government, governmentalized all property and goods and services. But, hit, but, but Hitler wanted to control Stalin. It was a fight between two socialists. Both of them killed masses of people to accomplish what they wanted to do. Both of them uh, destroyed private and personal ownership of things and took over state ownership of everything. But let me say something to you. Hitler was a hypocrite. He was a liar. <clears throat> and here, here's why. Stalin was a liar. Bernie Sanders is a liar. OAC is a liar. This Cortez woman up in New York, she is a liar. Not, and he, does anybody know tonight what congressmen get paid? I think it's 192. Is it 192,000? What is it? Huh? Is 172,000. That could be right. I'm not really, but I'm, it's pretty good pay. I mean, it's pretty big money. Now, she's got that money. She's receiving this gal, this, this gal that was elected up there, the running her mouth all the time. The one who just perpetrated so much that she got Amazon to leave New York the other day and bragged about it. Just lost 25,000 jobs out of New York because she hates anybody that's got any money and property. You know why she's a hypocrite? She just now rented a high-class, high-end apartment to stay in in Washington, D.C. that the average person in America couldn't even dream about staying in. And she get, let's take his figure, 172000 If she's a socialist, like she claims, why doesn't she share it with other people and just go out in the street now and say, hey, here's you 5000 here's you 5000 here's you 5000 Socialists, remember this, they're never socialists. None of them are. They're hypocrites and thieves. They're in the process of stealing people's money. So 
if they're truly socialist, they ought to share the wealth they have. Bernie Sanders is worth but somewhere between four and five million dollars. He has three homes. If he's truly a socialist, why didn't he sell some of his homes or, and let the poor move in? Why doesn't he take his senatorial salary and pass it out? Because he's a liar and a hypocrite of the first order. They don't sell their possessions. They don't give their wealth, and they don't re redistribute what they have. They want to take what you've got through taxation and bureaucracy and all this junk and take your, your money and give it to other people to buy their votes and retain their power. Modern socialists like Occupy Wall Street, the 99% group, BLM, and the Democrat Party. Now here is how Christian youth get tricked. Christian young people and millennials especially get tricked by the socialists. They have a three-point program. Here's what they say. Well, the Bi you claim you're a Christian. <clears throat> the Bible says that you should take care of the poor. It's true. The Bible says you should consider the poor. That you should help the poor. And it's a true statement. You watch this, just how Satan works. He takes a truth and then he injects a lie. Then the second thing they say is after they've established that Christians ought to help the poor and be considered of the poor and have compassion upon the poor, then they say socialism is a philosophy of life that cares and has compassion for the poor. So they start equating socialism with Christianity. Therefore, the conclusion is among millennials, Christian Bible college students, I like socialism because I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to help the poor and care about the poor. Socialism is a system of government that cares for the poor and the needy. So therefore, I will be a Christian socialist. And that's, where, that's how they're destroying the power of the church in this country. Socialism feeds, now watch this. Socialism, by the way, most Bible college students and most millennials are a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. Most, religion, most people sitting in churches in America are self-righteous hypocrites. They're do-gooders. They do not trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. They think how good they, they live is going to get them to heaven in the end. Oh, they'll talk the cross. Listen to me. They'll talk the cross and they'll talk grace, but they believe how well they live, whether they kept, kept saved or not, or are saved. And that's self-righteousness. <clears throat> Socialism feeds on the self-righteousness of mankind. Because if I can say that I care for the poor... If I get up and make a bunch of speeches acting like I care for the poor and the needy and the disadvantaged, that makes me a good person. And if I'm a good person, why do I need Christ for? Why do I need the cross? And you hypocrites that claim you're Christian people and you don't help the poor, but here I am. I care for the poor. I believe in socialism. Oh, and you're taking your boat rides, and you're spending all your money, and you're doing all this. And, that. and that's how Bernie talks. That's how she talks. And at the same time, they're lying right out their mouth, and they're doing the back, and, and they're not practicing what they preach. They're hypocrites. <clears throat> so I'm saying this. Socialism feeds on the self-righteousness, the natural self-righteousness of mankind, that I'm good. And because I care for the poor, <clears throat> Here's the problem the socialists have. Socialists, by and large, hate this book and the God of this book. They are basically humanist. And here's what they believe. And by the way, if you go into a, you get into the college circles and the educational circles, here's what they believe. They do not believe in the depravity of mankind. They believe that man is basically good, that there's a little spark of goodness and is waiting to be fanned by the right environment. And they're, they believe in self-righteousness. And so they have a false presupposition. And this is why they believe, and it makes them feel so good to think that they're lifting people up out of poverty, lifting people up out of their misery. We're being so helpful to people as long as they're taking your money to do it with. Now let me tell you something. Bad ideas lead to bad results. Bad ideas, bad beliefs, lead to bad results. Socialism steals wealth, redistributes a small percentage of it, retains most of it in the power of those in the top tier like Stalin and Hitler did. And worst of all, it kills and stifles incentiveness, opportunity, 
creativity, competition, and supply. You could invent the greatest thing out here tonight and want to, want to have it uh, uh, patented, but did you know in socialism, they, for one of the first things they do is kill patents. Because you are, you're as an individual don't count. It's the whole. So, Ralph, if you design a medicine or whatever it may be and you want to patent it or something that's going to be beneficial, it's not right for you to reap the benefits of it. So we're not going to allow patents. Because you get a patent and you got control of it and you can get rich off of it. <clears throat> now, that may sound good. Well, it's just not right for Ralph to make $5 million off his patent and us to have, and, and us to, have to pay for that. Poor people can't get their hands on this. Does anybody know what the problem with that is? That if Ralph comes up with this idea and I come in as the government and steal it from him and he gets no benefit from it, he's done coming up with ideas. He's done putting in his labor. And that's why, let me tell you about communist Russia. I was on the plane over there. Dean was with me. Danny was with me. Man, there uh, uh, from, from the American consulate and something. He was going over on some government business, sitting there in the seat. He said to me, he "said You ever been to Russia before?" I said, "No, never been there." He said, "It's a third world country except for its military." And he said, "Here's," he said, "It's, it's pitiful." He said, "They'll put on the facade in Moscow and stuff. I think it's a great nation, but he said it's, they're broke." This is back in the nineties. And this is what he said to me. He said, "Let me tell you how Russia works and why you need to appreciate where you're where you're flying from." He said, he said, they brag that they have the greatest and largest crops in the world. And he said, they do. They have a lot of land in Russia. But he said, what they won't tell you is that they only, only 30% of their, of their food products ever reaches the grocery store shelf. And the reason only 30% ever reaches is because in communism or socialism, which is their twin sisters, <clears throat> if you're driving a truck that takes the beets from the field to the plant, and the truck has a flat, or the combine breaks down, or the equipment breaks down, you have no incentive to get to town and get the thing fixed. And he said 70% of the food in Russia rots or, or ruins from the field to the, to the factories. Because nobody has any... Why, why should I jump and say, man, let's go to town and get the tire fixed so we can get this in before it ruins? Nobody, he said, has any incentive to do anything because they're all getting paid what the government says you're going to get whether you work or not. And if you don't work a little bit, they'll shoot you. So he says, you're going to do something. But he said, you have no incentive to go out and make, and make it be the most profitable, make it be the best product and the most efficient product. It, it destroys incentive. And that's where we're headed. Let me tell you something about the medicine deal, about why Obama's dad in his thesis thesis, I mean, literally just praised and, and, and longed for the day when America, when the, the government would own all industry and all land. He was a Marxist socialist. And when he wrote the book, Dreams of My Father, he was telling America something. I want to fulfill and fundamentally change America to a socialist country. So it steals the wealth of people. By the way, we, uh, what's George, George Pordia, missionary that we've supported? I think we're still supporting him. I'm not sure. He's from Romania. He was over here. He married an American girl, went to school up at Hiles Anderson College. <clears throat> went back, he and her went back to Romania as missionaries. Guy's done a great work. I like him. One of the best, I mean, one of the most likable missionaries. I mean, this guy's a worker. We just putting up hay. Old George, I'll tell you, we come around here and haul hay with us. My dad liked him. And George began to tell my dad what happened when the communists took over Romania after World War II. He said, they came down to my grandpa's farm and they walked his team out of the old barn. And he said, they put a, a pistol up to both of his horses and shot them, dropped them in their tracks and told, us, told him to take the harness off of them. And told him, get your stuff packed, you're moving into a high rise. The farm now belongs to the government. I don't know. I, I, I just, it made me tonight think I'd like to contact George and see. But he was hoping, this was in the 90s, and he was hoping because of the collapse of the Soviet Union that there might be a chance of them, their, his, descendants, his grandpa's descendants, getting the farm back and the land. 
How would you like to live in a country where socialism is implemented and they come out to your farm and say, none of this is yours, none of it. Off. That happened to millions upon multiplied millions of people. When we were in Russia, they had taken those people off their farms, communalized their farms, moved people into town, put them into high rises like you cannot believe, all of them the same. The only thing you had a difference in, you might be able to get orange or green carpet, your choice. The same thing with curtains. Every apartment was the same because everybody had to be equal. And they moved those people out of those farms and off of those places and they put them in these high rises and they're all over those big cities. You didn't have a choice. And then they assigned you the job you were going to do. You'll drive a truck. You'll work on the train. You'll do this and you'll do that. And then, by the way, a lot lot of people don't remember is that Lenin and Stalin burned the churches down and, and, and arrested preachers. Sent them to Siberia if they didn't kill them. It kills and stifles incentive. It kills opportunity, creativity, competition, and supply. Dean can verify this tonight. We looked, we stayed in a hospital. It wasn't it, Dean? We stayed in a hospital. I remember getting up one day and looking out the window of that hospital. We were up on what, third or fourth floor, maybe something like that. I don't remember exactly. But down there below, there was a line of women that went clear down the way and went around. They had little jugs with them. Now, this is in Kaluga, a town of 300 and some thousand people. That's a big city in my book. The women with their little jugs would come up. They had a horse. This is in the 90s. It looked like about a 300, maybe a 500-gallon plastic uh, 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 tank on a, on, on a two-wheeled trailer by, on, behind a horse and had a spigot back here, and the women were lined up for blocks. And you, when you got up there, you took your deal, and he took the spigot, turned and filled your milk deal with milk, handed it to you, and you went on. Another time, we saw them in line for bread. You walked into huge, huge uh, stores, supermarket stores. Walk up to the shelves. Dean, what was it? Stinking fish and nothing on the shelves. You'd go down the area where you might find canned goods. They might be a little stack of canned goods that big around right there and then empty shelves for 15 feet. Okay, here's the, here's the green beans, maybe five or ten cans of green beans, empty shelves for 15 feet. Got off International Airport in Russia, Moscow, Russia. Walked down through. They said, I said, where's the bathrooms? They said, just keep going that way. You'll know when you get close. <laughs> Moscow Airport down the lower section, a hole in the floor. That's where you went to the bathroom. Don't anybody ever tell you. I'm going to tell you something right now. There's a reason Venezuela is an uproar down there. Used to be the richest country in South America. It's doomed and damned as a nation unless they have it. Uh, throw that guy out of there. They've been robbed and pillaged by socialists. Socialism is a negative philosophy of life. No God, no creation, no morality, no fall of mankind, and no family, and no individuality, no incentive, and no hope. And that's why when you go into a country that has lived under socialism, there is a hopelessness in the eyes of the people of that nation. There's some wrong assumptions by socialists. And that is, number one, you hear that, well, the greedy capitalist. Greedy capitalist. Let me tell you about socialists. They're full of envy and jealousy. And they hate for anybody to do any good. I want to ask you a question. If this is a greedy capitalist nation, <clears throat> tell me the nation that has helped more people in this world than this nation. I don't know of a country in this world. We rebuilt Europe. We rebuilt Japan. We airlifted food to the East Germans. We've sent more money, more food right now. Did you know that the socialist president who was voted out and won't get out, Maduro, is not allowing American food to be sent to the Venezuelan people tonight? That's socialism for you. He doesn't even want his own people. He wants them to keep digging in the garbage pans. He wants them to keep scraping the sewer lids have you seen the have you seen the videos of mothers taking spoons and scraping off the garbage cans and the dumpsters trying to get food for their little kids how'd you like to go out tonight that's socialism for you and we better watch this thing they say capitalism is greedy well i'll tell you this i don't know anybody in the world that's helped more people than america has 
And by the way, you can't help somebody if you're not able to help somebody. That's what I was talking to you about this morning. My, my mom talking about my grandpa. He believed in having lots of fruit trees and planting twice the potatoes you was going to need and twice the green beans you was going to need so that they'd be sure to have enough, but so that they might have enough to help some neighbor that was going through a little tough time. Amen. You can't help people if you ain't got anything to help them with. If the government takes it all from you, you sure ain't got anything to help them with. Socialists, they believe capitalism is greedy. They believe that man is basically good when he's not. And they believe giving stuff to people lifts people out of poverty, which it does not do. In fact, it does just the opposite. It creates dependence upon a government entity. And it, create, it turns government into God for them. Socialists, by the way, the truth is socialists are greedy. Socialists are jealous. Socialists are envious. Socialists are covetous. Socialists are thieves. They're evil. And they're lazy. But the fallen nature of man, and here's the danger, the fallen nature of man buys into it because we always want something for nothing. We want a free lunch. We want to get it without working for it, without being personally responsible for it. Now, our forefathers believed in a principle called self-interest. And uh, you may think that sounds bad, but let me tell you, it's good. Self-interest means that you have personal responsibility to take care of you and your family. Right. And it's nobody else's responsibility to feed you and your family. It's yours. Right. Personal responsibility. Let me give you this. You have personal responsibility to God tonight. Did you know you're going to give account for yourself? I'm not giving account for you. You're going to, and you don't give account for me. I have a self-interest. We are, you are, it, hey, self-interest is wonderful. Because it says... You better take an interest in your soul. You better take an interest in your salvation. You better take an interest in uh, where you're going to sleep at tonight. You better take an interest in how you're going to feed your family. You better take an interest in things. And let me say to you that when I took an interest in my salvation, one of the first things that happened to me was I got interested in other people being saved. But if before, I was, before I had self-interest, I wasn't interested or cared whether people got saved or not. And it works the same way. Now, I'm going to challenge tonight. I don't know if there's any socialist here or socialist listening, but I'm going to challenge socialists tonight. If you're listening to me or do listen to this, and especially I'm going to challenge little Mrs. Cortez or whatever her name is, and Bernie and Pelosi and Obama, I'm going to give them a challenge. Now, listen to me. Here's the challenge. If you are a true socialist, take your next check and go distribute it. Wherever it comes from, take your next check down the street or down the road and redistribute it. Cash it and redistribute it. <clears throat> I wish they'd let me on a talk show. I'd like to debate that little gal. Because I dare her. You say, you're a so are you a socialist? Oh, yeah, I'm a socialist. All right, if you're a true socialist, take your next check, cash it, and start distributing that money. I'm not a socialist. I ain't doing it. You can sit back there tonight and talk about, oh, you like this kind of stuff. Well, I want to tell you tonight, how many of you tonight want to move out of your house? If you're a socialist here tonight, why don't you just sell your house and give it to me, give the money to me? Maybe, maybe Phil, would you like to have it? You take it. No, you're not a socialist. And they're not either. They're liars. Wherever it comes from, the check is go down the street and do it. And then <clears throat> I want to tell them to do something else. If they really believe in their immigration policy, Nancy Pelosi, if you honestly believe in your immigration policy, open up your private gate and let illegals, not, not citizens, but illegals come through your gate into your yard and take your $192 million that you're supposedly worth, get it out of the bank and get it out of the stock stuff and go help those poor people, get your little backside down to the border where they're at and get you some money and some food and help those people. Makes me mad. Sell your million dollar homes. The lionest bunch of stuff I've ever seen in my life. They're not socialists, they're thieves. And I challenge any socialist in this country to do just what I said. They will not do it. I haven't ever heard of the first socialist 
that took his paycheck, cashed it, and took it down the street to his neighbors. Some of you don't like me using the word backside. It's the best I can do. Okay, I'm sorry. Front side, back side, upside down, whatever you want to call it. Just get yourself down there. Okay. I know I'm not the smoothest stone in God's deal. Okay, I understand that. But they're hypocrites. Now, I want to show you the difference between capitalism. How many, what would you describe Trump as? What is Trump? He's a capitalist. Big time. Obama, what would you say he was? Who has given their salary away? Who has given their salary away? Did you know that Trump's given every bit of his presidential salary to different places where he feels like it helps people? Check it out. So isn't that strange that a man who's a capitalist who got up and said the other day, socialism will never be in this country, is the one who's giving to people who have needs. But the one who gets up and says, well, to be socialist, don't give a dime of what he's got to anybody. Built himself a 14-foot wall around a multi-million dollar piece of property that he and his wife bought in Washington, D.C., a few, a, a few blocks down from the Capitol. And he helps nobody. Obama, you're a stinking hypocrite. And all of your crowd is. Jesus said this, you'll always have the poor with you. Hmm, wonder why. A lot of reasons for that. Sometimes circumstances that may not have control over. Sometimes it's war. Sometimes it's famine. Sometimes it's ignorance. Sometimes the lack of skills and so forth. Sometimes it's been locked into a government policies and, and so forth and programs. Sometimes bad choices. Sometimes no skills. Sometimes when it won't work, I don't know. The other day, I mean, I go by these guys and they got their signs out and stuff like that. You know, I, I'm just, I don't, I'm sorry. I just don't want, we have people come by here almost every week, come by this church while the school's going on. Wanting so forth, you know, and it's hard to know, and we want to help people, but we don't give cash. You know, we'll let, give them some uh, gas or we'll give them some food, but we do not give cash. Now, if you want to take your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, you're kind of there. I want to show you about the Apostle Paul. Let's see if Paul was a socialist launching out of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 20, he's getting ready to go. And when you pick it up in verse number 33, Paul said this. I'll give you just a second to get to get there. And uh, Paul said in verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. I don't want other people's stuff. Ye yourselves know how these hands, did you get that? These hands. Boy, I'd like, I, I can just see Paul taking his hands out. These hands have, he said, these hands have ministered unto whose necessities? My necessities. Well, Paul, you're taking care of yourself before you take care of other people. Hmm? and to them that were with me. See, that's how you really help people. You make sure that you're able, strong enough to help, to, to be able to work and, and earn and do whatever, and then you're able to help other people. He said in verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring. You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, I sat around waiting for a check from the church. I didn't send out, you know, all this stuff and appeals. I'm really aggravated at a preacher I had a lot of respect for, but he's turned his whole ministry now into, into a, a money-grabbing machine. He's selling his CDs for $12 a piece, won't put them out free. I mean, he's a preacher. Don't, he's a preaching machine. And now he's, now he's getting on telling everybody that, well, we're reaching 70-some million people, and we need your money, and he's doing it over social media. He does not need that kind of money to get the gospel out over social media, and his CDs cost him about 32 cents a piece, maybe. What are they costing? Do you have any idea? But, but I'm just saying to buy them off of, just to buy the CD by itself. But if you got them ready, about a dollar. You know what? Any business in the world like it from a dollar to 12 bucks real good. That's pretty good business to be in. He said, I've showed you all things how it's so laboring you ought to support the weak. He said, how are you going to support the weak? By laboring. By working yourself. And remember the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let me tell you something. It's wonderful to be able to go out and work, earn a living, and then be able to take it and help somebody in need. It's a blessing, amen. It's a blessing. But socialism is already heavy in our country. FDR set us up on a different track. And we've got Social Security, welfare, and pensions, and farm programs, and now we've got housing, and food, and medical, and dental care, and money, outright money. 
And a lot of times that the worst welfare deal is in these, when legislation is passed, just like, and I didn't, I, 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 I'm not going to be, but I think he should not have signed that legislation today because there's so much pork in that thing, it's unbelievable. He should have told them you can just, you can just do without it. You know, you could just get into everything. I get, I get tired of these farmers who take every program the government's got and you take in $35,000 worth of well pipe and everything else and some other taxpayer paid for it and it increases the value of your farm. I'm going to just tell you something. I've got farmers all over this country mad at me because I preached on this stuff. They won't hardly even speak to me. Because they went over here to Hartville and got every ASES program they could get. And they're no, it's no different than anything else. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And then you got up here, let me ju it's just like socialism. I'll tell you right now, that, that woman cost New York 25,000 jobs. I read this today. I don't know whether it's true or not. They claim the average job salary is $150,000 a person. That's, un that's unimaginable to me. I don't, maybe it's true. I don't know. But if it is, figure out 25,000 jobs times 150,000 a year and see what socialism just took out of New York. Jesus taught private ownership and private responsibility in the parable of the talents. If you read Matthew chapter 25 and Matthew chapter 20, he said, Is it not, and what is the power of mine had to do with mine? What is mine own? That's not socialism. Socialism has killed more people, caused more misery, destroyed more dreams, stole more freedom and liberty, liberty caused more poverty than any other philosophy in the face of this earth. And we give you five reasons to reject socialism. Socialism is based on exclusive materialistic worldview. That poverty is the greatest problem we have. That's a lie. When you only have a materialistic worldview, you miss out that there is a spiritual worldview, and poverty is not the greatest problem. Sin is the greatest problem. But socialism says that it's based upon the exclusive materialistic worldview. And the Bible teaches a spiritual worldview. And I'm going to tell you, God even says that he has chosen the rich of this world, uh, the poor of this world, rich in faith. Jesus let the Lazarus die at the gate of, of the rich man. Jesus did I believe they were real people. He said a certain man. He named Lazarus. I believe they live somewhere. They're probably around Jerusalem in the gated community area. And Jesus didn't run down there and grab Lazarus and say, hey man, come on up here to the, the place. As far as I know, our Lord and Savior let Lazarus die at the gate of the rich man. That'll blow you out. Number two, socialism punishes virtue. Mark said, from each according to his ability, each according to his need. In other words, some people will work and some won't, but everybody will get the same thing. It does not work. The virtue of hard work, creativity, and risk. It destroys creativity and cinemas, as I said earlier, the, the little hen story. Socialism, number three, socialism promotes and endorses and mandates stealing. Obama's thesis, and by the way, I don't know how many ever know about this deal, but Obama was at a place one day, and he was trying to promote his socialistic agenda, and he popped up with an illustration. There's a girl there that had a pizza, and he took that pizza that girl had, and he said, now, don't you think that you should share your pizza with these kids over here? And the girl said, well, I, I guess, you know, she's kind of embarrassed in what I do. He said, don't you think it would be right for you to share your pizza with them? And she just kind of nodded her head and went along with it. And he used that as an illustration that, you know, if you've got a pizza, you need to share with people over here who don't have pizza. Anybody ain't got any problem with that? I got a problem with that. Now, if I want to share it, and I say, hey, you know what? There's no problem with that. But when you tell me and make me share my pizza with somebody, I ain't going to like that. Huh? That's right, a cheerful giver. Not, a, not somebody that takes it and coerces it and compulsory thing out of it. Socialism does not believe in private property. There's a big difference between giving somebody a piece of your pizza and being forced to give it to other people or intimidated to it. And socialism is a government ownership of all land, industry, and housing, and so forth. Biblical, the Bible teaches stewardship. Stewardship in and of its own nature teaches that you own personal things and you're, steward, you're a steward of it. It implies ownership. Number four, socialism encourages and fuels envy, jealousy, laziness, and class warfare. And I am telling you, we're in the middle. You talk about they are like little rats trying to constantly stir up class warfare in this country. And this is what the Hispanic thing, the Mexican thing is all about. It's what the black thing is all about. It's what the woman thing is all about. And they just pick as many minority deals and having people clashing all the time, hating each other, feeling victimized. They demonize the rich. 
And these Democrat socialists, they fuel racism, that they fester hatred and envy between groups of people within a nation to accomplish the destruction of a society. Number five, socialism seeks to destroy marriage and the family. And I said earlier tonight, this is where I'm going to with this thing. It's very destructive to Christianity and the gospel. The state replaces the God-ordained home and family. If you don't believe this is true, you know historically that Stalin and Hitler both, who were, not, who were socialists, took over the, the children, and they, the family didn't matter anymore. In fact, Hitler's whole idea was, I mean, he went in, even went into what they call breeding programs. He didn't want the home and family. He wanted the kids to be wards of the state. You had your Hitler youth. Engels, who is Marxist contemporary, said the same thing. He said, quote, the single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. Private, house, uh, private housekeeping is transformed into a social industry. The care and education of the children become a public affair. And Hitler did this. Now let me tell you where all this is coming out of. Right now is our colleges and, and, and universities in America, and I'm going to tell you they're socialist hell holes. And let me show you how they are. You sleep till 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning because you can structure your classes, you know, late in the day. So you party till 2 o'clock in the morning. You get up at 9, 10. Then you go down to the... Uh, cafeteria and you eat and then you go to your classes and then you go back out and party and you circle and you know what you're, you do this four or five years you're a professional student and you got tenured professors standing in front of you who are being paid by the taxpayer who are living out their socialistic dream and telling you that's what you ought to be and by the time they get out of most of those places, they're lazier and hound dogs, think the world owes them a living, won't get up, won't go to work. But they want to get rid of the family. That's what your sodomite, that's why socialists, you ever notice how socialists and sodomites dovetail? Man, I mean, they're right in the ring together. Destruction of the family unit, destruction of the family home. The greatest reason to reject and fight socialism, though, is not because of all the things I've said tonight. The greatest reason to fight socialism is because socialism destroys faith in God and the need for the gospel and the free presentation of the gospel. And thus, millions in socialistic countries have the gospel hidden from their lives and wind up and die and go to hell because socialism replaced capitalism and biblical Christianity. God is not glorified. People die and go to hell. And Satan loves socialism because it removes Christianity from the nation. That's what they're all after. I'm going to give the church a warning tonight. I'm going to say something. People, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on Reggie tonight, okay? But history will teach us things. We are at a very critical time in our nation. History teaches something. The socialists of our nation know it. And you can tell they know it by the way they're conducting themselves right now. You can, you can just read it. It's there. They know this, that the philosophy of socialism is a conduit to communism. And they know that Historically speaking, every socialist or communist nation, that every, every nation that could not achieve socialism through what they call peaceful means, through the legislature, courts, taxation, and regulation, must move to a violent overthrow. And I'm going to tell you what I think is coming, and I'm not joking. I, 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 I pray that this doesn't happen, but I'm afraid it's going to. Did you ever notice how socialists are so against the Second Amendment? They hate the Second Amendment. And there's a reason they hate the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is what would keep them from taking over a violent overthrow. They will resort to force here in a few years if they're not successful politically. You can mark it. And they are so serious. This is why the presidential office is so critical to them. They, they've had the courts for a long time, and they don't have the court now. And they're shook up about it. They have one side of the Congress, 
but they can't pass the first. They can't pass any law Pelosi wants to if the president doesn't sign it and the Senate doesn't pass it. So it's very limited power. But they know something that the president office, the president is the commander in chief of the military. And they are bent on getting a president in office who will use his power as commander in chief to turn the military. And you heard Nancy Pelosi say this week that if Trump can make an executive order on the wall, we will have a president make an executive order on firearms in the Second Amendment. And she is sending a message across the whole socialistic cultural society. Get ready. Because we're going to use Trump as a basis to make our big move. They will resort to force, terror, violence, and threat. But they want the military within their grasp and the power of the presidency to control its commander-in-chief. This is why the Second Amendment is a flashpoint in the battle lines of our nation right now. And with all that's within them, they want rid of the Second Amendment. I'm going to make a prediction to you. If this nation does not have revival and God does not have mercy upon this country, you're going to see a civil war in this country. It may not be in my lifetime, but it might be. We're dangerously, seriously close. These people are fuming. They are burned up. You see, here's what happened. They thought that they had this thing moving all, oh, we weren't coming as fast as they wanted us to, but we were moving down their socialistic railroad track until Trump hit them. And when that happened, then the, judge, the judge's deal changed. And there was an awakening in the country. And now they're saying, well, maybe we're not going to be able to have a peaceful transition into a socialist communist country. And if that be the case, and here's what I will tell you. If Trump gets reelected, look out, you right. And here's why. Because they will know that he will appoint at least two, if not three, more Supreme Court justices. And I'm just telling you, historically, that's where it goes. If they can't change it peacefully, quote, legislatively, the process, then they resort to violence. That's what every socialistic, communistic nation has done in history. And if you don't think it'll come here, and if you think, I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't think those socialists will cut your throat, kill you so fast, make your head swim, you do not know mankind. They, are, they will be out to shut down every church that believes the Bible that does not conform to what they want preached. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Socialism is already in this country heavy. Schools in America are socialistic breeding grounds. And they control them. I want to ask you a question tonight. Would you like for there just to be one grocery store in Mountain Grove? A government grocery store? Would you like for there just to be one gas station, a government-owned gas station? Would you want every business in Mountain Grove to be owned by the government and you had no choice where you could shop? Why is it we want one government-owned education system? Why is it they'll fight to the death for that thing? Because they know that's their ace in the hole. They'll let the old folks die off. And we've got a new generation. And you say, that's why in our colleges, in our millennial group, yeah, we'd vote for a socialist. They've been trained to. They've been educated and brain trained to. And what the church is not realizing tonight is that right out from underneath us, we're being, our faith will be stolen, destroyed, and we'll wake up someday in a socialist country, and all of a sudden we'll get letters, and it'll tell us what we can do, what we can't do. You say, Reggie, you're being over the top. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. It has happened. I gave you a young man I talked to, George Pordia, who saw it. His grandpa saw it happen. They came into the farm and they took it all. And they shut it down. Your business, your land, your house will belong to them. And if you don't straighten up and fly right, they'll put you out of business. That's, what, that's the way they operate. 
because they don't believe there's a God that they ever have to give an account to anybody. To anybody. They believe they're God. Let's stand and go home. Our Father, tonight we come before you and we pray, Heavenly Father, that I remember, Lord, where you said, if the, trump, if, if the trumpet make an uncertain sound. God, I pray that you'd help churches and Americans and Christian people to raise the trumpet up and make the sound of the alarm of what's happening. Lord, I believe with all of my heart that we are closer to greater danger tonight than we've ever been in this nation's history. God, I believe we could be facing a conflagration, Lord, that would make the Civil War look tame. God, tonight I pray that you'll spare America from that. I pray, oh God in heaven, that you'll raise up people in this nation who believe the Bible and believe in freedom and liberty. God, I pray tonight that you'll help us to change people's minds and hearts through the powerful, through the preaching of the cross, through the work of the Holy Ghost, and changing their hearts and the way they think. But, oh, God, tonight, the vacuum of a godless, Bibleless generation has been filled with a satanic doctrine of humanism and socialism. God, Satan's design is to destroy Christianity from the face of this nation. And that multitudes upon multitudes would die and go to hell because they cannot hear the gospel. The light of the gospel has been put out. Now, Lord, we do praise you tonight. We give you glory and we rejoice in the truth of Scripture, knowing that if God be for us, who can be against us? And, Lord, we want to, we want to be, Lord, just firing all the way to glory. But, Lord, we pray tonight that you would have mercy upon America and raise us up leaders and raise us up people who will stand, and having done all to stand, who know what they believe and why they believe it and who won't be fooled by these lies. God, I just pray that in all of these things that you might receive the glory and the honor. For, Lord, that is their goal, is to take you out of society. That you might, Lord, be blotted out of a culture, blotted out of a society. Lord, they want to chase like the French did back, Lord, in the French Revolution. They want to take the Bible. and, Lord, it's an amazing thing to me, God, that they took a donkey, the emblem of the Democrat Party, and tied a Bible to his tail and chased it out of Paris, symbolizing their disdain for the Bible and chasing God out of their culture. God, tonight I pray, let us not go down without fighting to our last breath and our last drop of blood for the truth of the gospel. Lord, we pray for awakening in this country. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the Bible and your truth, Heavenly Father, that Lord, you said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, Father, I pray that you'll bless these families this week, or they're going to be going out and working. They ain't got time to be marching in the street somewhere. God, they're going to be working and trying to raise their family and pay their bills and contribute, Lord, to the society and contribute, Lord, to uh, things, Heavenly Father. And, Lord, I'm glad that you're a God who freely gives and doesn't compulse us. Lord, you put in our hearts the desire to give. Help us, Lord, to be willing to help the poor and consider the poor, Heavenly Father. And let us not get sour, Lord, toward those that are disadvantaged. But God, on the other hand, help us to stand for the truths of thy word so that we can help those, Lord, as we're able to. We love you, Lord. You've been so good to us. Thank you for a good day. Lord, I just pray, oh God, we pray tonight for 18 more preachers at least. Labors in the Lord. We love you, God. Just ask you to work among us. And, Lord, just pray that the power of God would fall upon this place and these people in our work. And, Lord, keep us from sin this week. Help me, Lord, to think right and do right. And I know, Lord, I'll get out there tomorrow and the devil will throw a ranch at me. But, God, I pray, help me to have up the shield and help me to walk close to you, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you Wednesday night, Lord willing. I love you.